Hi, folks. Um, looks like we have a full house, so let's start. My name's Mary Morgan, and we have Spanish interpretation available. Nora Goodfriend Coven is our interpreter. Headsets are available at the back of the sanctuary. Buenas noches, bienvenidos. Uh, si quiere interpretación, hay estos audífonos. Y puede señalarle a Edmin que está con una cámara allá. Y le va, le va a traer uh, los audífonos y sirven en todo el salón. So I want to welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have so many people here. And on behalf of Indivisible West Marin and Main Street Moms, we are thrilled to gather together here to talk about something that is important to all of us, and that's our democracy. Indivisible West Marin is dedicated to electing Democrats nationwide, lobbying for progressive legislation, rebuilding our democracy, and defeating the Trump agenda. Main Street Moms... <laughs> Main Street Moms is a 15-year-old group of West Marin moms and honorary moms committed to securing a more viable future for our children through education and engagement in all kinds of issues from the environment to elections. Virtually every member of both organizations did something to encourage, to support, and work on this event. Thank you, thank you, thank you to each one of you. A special thank you to Steve Costa for technical assistance and to KWMR for recording and making this audio available on its website in a special new archives project. So a few housekeeping, yes, please, KWMR. <laughs> So a few more housekeeping matters. Once again, Spanish interpretation is available. Nora's in the back, and there are headsets available there. Uh, please turn your phones, beepers, anything else off. I've already turned mine off, but I can feel it beeping at me. Uh, bathrooms are in the back in the dining area where we had uh, some nibbles. Please, no food or water or drink in the sanctuary. I think water's okay, but uh, if there's any doubt, or if you have just an open glass, please, if you can, leave it outside. There is a, a container at, at, out the front door for donations, if you are so inclined, and that's, we're very grateful, and that's merely to cover our expenses. Sign-up sheets will be circulated uh, during the question and answer period, and if you're interested in getting more information about either organization or just getting more information about something you can do to get involved, please sign up, and if you have specific questions, please indicate that. And finally, on each chair, there was a flyer. Hold on to it, very important piece. It's about uh, the state legislative races that we're going to be talking about toward the end, and actions, concrete actions that each one of us can take together. And we'll talk more about that later. So Indivisible West Marin and Main Street Moms are thrilled to put on this event, not only to educate ourselves about gerrymandering and voter suppression, but more importantly, to inspire and encourage all of us to take a stand to help rebuild our democracy. So what's all the fuss? What is gerrymandering? What in the world does that mean? Very simply, it's the drawing of electoral district boundaries to influence the outcome of an election by intentionally including some kinds of people in the district and excluding others. And our speaker, Victoria Bassetti, is going to explain the nuts and bolts of how this works. Why does this matter? Why should we here in California be concerned about something that's basically happening in other places? Please come in. There, there are more seats. Please come in. <laughs> um, why should we be concerned? 
Well, I want you to listen very carefully for the next hour or so, because this seemingly wonky exercise of redistricting, usually done out of sight and without our knowledge, is eroding our democracy. It is as pernicious a form of voter suppression as a poll tax or a required voter ID. The agenda this evening is very simple. I'm going to introduce Victoria in a second. You'll really appreciate why we are so grateful to have her come here. She's going to talk to us about voter man, uh, gerrymandering and voter suppression. I'm then going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the 2019 state legislative races that we can be involved in and what exactly we can do starting now. And then we're going to have questions and answers, and sign-up sheets will be circulated during that time. So let me tell you about Victoria Bassetti. Uh, she's kind enough to join us from New York City, although it wasn't too hard to entice her because she has family here. She's one of us. Her family lives in San Geronimo. And as her stepmom says, we're locals. We know where to go. <laughs> so Victoria is currently a fellow at, there are seats up here. There, there are seats up here. Um, Victoria is currently a fellow at New York University Brennan Center for Justice, which is the preeminent voter suppression legal resource in the country. Uh, she is the author of Electoral Dysfunction, a great book if you haven't seen it. And it's a companion book, actually, for a PBS documentary by the same name, electoral dysfunction. I highly recommend the film, even if you don't read the book. It's very informative, it's based on the book, and it's also very funny. Uh, Victoria's work has appeared many places, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Harper's, the Washington Monthly, and USA Today, among others. And she's recently com completed a book that's going to come out in January, and she's done that with Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. The subject is gun control and violence. Before she was at the Brennan Center, she worked on Capitol Hill for almost a decade. She served as chief counsel to Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, and she was chief counsel and staff director of a subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee. She was on the team that drafted the very important September 11 Victim Compensation Fund, and she was also on the team of lawyers that oversaw the Senate impeachment trial of President Bill Clinton. Victoria, welcome. <laughs> So we're going to adjust the mic real quickly. Thanks. Better. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Can everyone hear me OK? Oh, terrific. So I really want to thank um, the extraordinary Mary Morgan for putting this together. Um, <laughs> I, I, I haven't known her for long, but I can tell she's a force. Uh, and I really want to thank Main Street Moms and Indivisible West Marin for inviting me here. As, as she mentioned, it was pretty convenient. I was, uh, I was already here visiting my dad and stepmom, and so it was just a, a quick drive down the highway to get here. Not the, not the highway, it's not down Sir Francis Drake. Uh, so, but, but even though it's kind of convenient, um, I would have come here anyway because the issue is urgent. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the most incredible turning points in the future of our American democracy coming up over the course of the next few years. It's a critical few years when the, for the fight for the future and the fairness of our democracy. And gerrymandering is an incredibly big part of it because gerrymandering creates durable structural barriers to democracy working. It makes it really hard for a majority political party to actually win control of the House of Representatives. It can lead to situations in states where state legislators 
act in defiance of the majority of the population, it's insidious. And every 10 years, state representatives in 50 states, not, not in DC, um, in 50 states get together and draw lines on maps to determine the way you are represented. And it's sort of like creating the, the literally the bone structure for our democracy. It's the way representation occurs. Um, and you might think it's a pretty straightforward thing. It doesn't seem like it's really all that hard to draw a congressional district or a state senate district or, or anything like that. There's a few pretty straightforward principles. Make sure everyone gets equal representation. So don't draw a district that one district that's got 500 people and another district that's got 10,000 people. Unequal, unfair. Um, make sure that you keep communities of interest together. Don't draw a district that has some Marin voters in it combined with Central Valley voters. Now, you, you may laugh and think it's ridiculous, the idea that someone could draw a district that would link Marin and the Central Valley together, but don't laugh. It's perfectly possible, and I'm going to show you examples of that happening, not necessarily in California, but in other states. Um, and the thing about it is, is that when you draw lines, and when drawing those lines are directly linked to your ability to maintain political power, it shouldn't surprise you that nothing is straightforward. Um, and th those lines are drawn in a way that directly impacts representation in our democracy. So welcome to gerrymandering, a complicated and controversial way that voting boundaries are drawn so that voters in one group make their votes more effective than voters in another group. And what it does is, by gerrymandering, it wastes, wastes, and that's the word that's used, it wastes second group votes artificially, essentially suppressing their vote. As a result of the last round of redistricting, which occurred in the wake of the 2010 census, there were a lot of states that were really seriously gerrymandering. And there's one study that indicates that pretty much every two years when we have a congressional election, as a result of that gerrymandering, 4.4 million votes are suppressed or wasted. Um, and gerrymandering is actually as old as the United States. That fellow up there on that slide to the left, that's Eldridge Gary. So there's a whole gif jif gerrymandering, gerrymandering thing going on, but we're just gonna call it gerrymandering because there's no turning back to gerrymandering. <laughs> um, so that's Eldridge Gary for whom we call gerrymandering. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He was the fifth vice president of the United States. He was the governor of Massachusetts, and his name is Mud because of gerrymandering. <laughs> what you'll see on the left side of the slide is a state district that was created in 1812 by the Republican Democrats in the state of Massachusetts, where they drew a series of state districts, state senate districts, that were intentionally drawn in a way to suppress the Federalists and keep Federalists from winning seats. And as a result of it, you can see that sort of, they called it a salamander-shaped district, and so that's where we get the word gerrymandering. In fact, actually, the first gerrymander occurred before 1812. It occurred in 1789, the first congressional election, when Patrick Henry in Virginia essentially created the situation where James Monroe and James Madison were forced up to, to drew districts in a way that would actually force them to battle each other for the, for the seat. And so uh, James Madison and James Monroe were actually the first victims of uh, gerrymander. But we, you know, we, we stick with the, seven, with the 1812 version of gerrymandering. Um, so um, I want to talk real quickly about the current, but, but it's a currently urgent issue. Okay, it's, it's not just you know, kind of all history from 1812 or anything like that. It's something that's really impacting us right now. So in 2010, Karl Rove, I'm gonna let you guys read this. I'm not gonna read over it. You don't need me to you know, read, read pieces of information to you. But the bottom line, as you can see, is, is that as a result of redistricting in 2010, where the, um, there was a substantial amount of gerrymandering in a bunch of states, during the two, 2012, congressional election, Democrats won the, the national kind of vote for the House of Representatives by 2.5 million votes, but didn't come anywhere close to taking or maintaining control of the House of Representatives. Uh, this is the legacy of something that's called Red Map, 
which is a Republican effort that was initiated in 2010. Uh, in that year, in the Wall Street Journal, Karl Rove wrote, quite forthrightly, that he who controls redistricting can control Congress. So thanks to the gains made in state houses, so state governors, state houses, state senates in 2010, Republicans controlled the redistricting process in states that had 40% of the seats in the House, and Democrats controlled it in states with 10% of the seats. The rest of the seats were drawn usually by courts or states with divided governments or commissions. But with that 40% lock, the Republicans managed to essentially radically alter the future of the House of Representatives for a decade. Once again, we're headed towards another redistricting cycle, and the same thing is at stake again. Now, I, I, want, I, I, I want to hasten to add that Democrats are not exactly innocent of this, OK? So Democrats have gerrymandered a lot, too. Um, it's just in 2010, it was really driven by um, the Republicans. Um, so in 2018, it essentially took a, a generational tsunami to break the impact of, ger of gerrymandering firewalls in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, North Carolina. And all we got was, all the Democrats got was a, 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 10, a 40 seat gain, right? Um, just to give you a sense of perspective, in, in 2010, when there was a smaller wave and far less gerrymandering, uh, Republicans managed to get 63 seats. So that kind of gives you a sense of the, of the disproportionate impact of gerrymandering in the 2018 election. It took a tsunami. A, a tsunami. So, you know, let's go back to when I was talking about in Marin, you wouldn't put a bunch of Marin voters together with a bunch of Central Valley voters. So we tend to think of gerrymandering as a sort of crime against geography. So, all, you know, people, and, and all of these uh, districts have funny names. You'll hear, you're, you'll hear this sort of like the gerrymanders, the salamander. You hear there's, there's an earmuffs district. There's a bug splat district. There's one called the mask of Zorro. There's one called the, called the, the praying mantis. I am going to focus on the Pennsylvania 7th Congressional District, um, which prior to gerrymandering from 2003 to 2013 was there. If you look a little bit carefully, what you can see is it's sort of on the outskirts of Philadelphia. It, it includes what's kind of the Philadelphia main line, and I don't know if, if anyone is from around there. It's a, um, it's a, a typically upper middle class white neighborhood, but there is also a, um, a large um, minority community, there's a large minority community within it too. After it was gerrymandered, <laughs> From 2013 to 2018, that's what it happened. And it is known as Goofy Kicking Donald Duck. Um, so that's Goofy, that is Goofy Kicking Donald Duck. You can sort of, you can see it, you know. I, sometimes I don't know where they come up with these names, but you know. Um, so that's what happened from 2013 to 2018 when it was gerrymandered. And it is a strange, strange district where it's sort of like having a bunch of Marin and Central Valley and you know maybe San Diego voters all put together into one district. It was sort of like a, an assault on community. Um, it was an, an assault on representing a community of interest. Um, just to kind of scroll ahead really quickly to the punchline, it's been reconstituted um, as a result of a, of a court case. But I'm gonna stick with, with goofy kicking Donald Duck for a little bit. It results in some very, very strange things. Uh, the old Pennsylvania 7th sliced and diced five different counties and 26 municipalities. That little red dot there I went to about 18 months ago, um, it's about the size of a interstate. It is a, all it is, um, and this is a big part of, the, it, this is a, a section of the district, all it really is is a restaurant here, Creed's, and it is surrounded entirely by interstates. So that's, sort of, that, that's the sort of thing that gerrymanderers do. They'll, they'll run a district along a highway line um, to connect two really random or disparate parts of a community. Let's go up to this next part. This is a little bit um, kind of north and east of there. This is, this, is Goofy's, this is Goofy's head right here, as you can see, and we're at his neck. Um, uh, that it, it, you literally have to take a rowboat to get from one part of the district to another. Um, you have to cross the, um, the, the railroad tracks, and then you have to get in a rowboat. 
um, to get to the other side of the district. So this is sort of like, this is insulting because, like I said, it's really an assault on the community of interest. It's, it's a, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Imagine being a voter in that district trying to figure out how you can get your the attention of your representative for your particular town, which maybe needs a, you know, a federal transportation grant. Um, how are you going to get your member of Congress's attention? You're, you're not going to be able to. But what's really going on with gerrymandering? We're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Gerrymandering kind of tends to be divided into three big categories. And the first one is called partisan gerrymandering. That is you know, essentially where um, one party that controls the state house attempts to draw the lines in a way that assures that a disproportionate number of the seats it can be a state house seat, it can be a state senate seat, it can be a house of representatives seat, but a disproportionate number of the seats um, go to members of that party. And this is what was done in Texas, a lot of partisan gerrymandering. And what you're seeing there is Austin. Those Right in the center, where you see all of those different colors kind of coalesce, is Austin, Texas. Liberal, liberal Austin, Texas is represented by six members of Congress, five of whom are Republican. And the reason is, is what they managed to do is basically toss 20% of Austin residents into the 31st, 20% into the 35th. 18% into the 10th. So they, they basically sliced and diced Austin up into all these districts. So at the little kind of tip is Austin, and then it balloons out and just grabs in a ton of Republicans. So that is partisan gerrymandering, and it is uh, a, a, a pervasive thing. The next thing that we have is racial gerrymandering. This is North Carolina. Um, obviously, I think, and you can, you can see um, the two districts there, t the 12th and the 1st Congressional District, by the way, both of which were declared unconstitutional. Um, so they've been, reconfig they've been reconfigured. Um, and in that, that 12th Congressional District, you can see there, there are large swaths of it that l are literally just the interstate because they're, they're connecting, what they're doing is they're connecting African-American voters. Um, and that's the same thing that's going on at that bottom part of the first congressional district in North Carolina. And this is known by a pretty offensive term, which is known as bleaching. So what they were doing is, by creating racial black districts, they were bleaching the districts surrounding it. Um, still happens a lot, though. For example, in Virginia, a similar district was racially gerrymandered um, and was also declared unconstitutional by a court uh, because they packed too many black voters into Bobby Scott's district, essentially weakening the cloud of blacks in nearby districts. Um, in 2016, the ruling that held that the um, Virginia gerry racial gerrymander was unconstitutional actually ended up allowing a Democrat, Donald McEachin, to represent the fourth district in a newly convened House of Representatives. So it basically, by, by breaking apart the racial gerrymandering in Virginia, they essentially managed to add an additional Democrat to their delegation. Um, so, it, so racial uh, uh, gerrymandering oftentimes has a partisan impact. Um, so, um, so that's what happened in Virginia. And in North Carolina, when they reconfigured all of these districts, they made them more compact. Um, it didn't actually end up changing the partisan makeup. Of the, of, the, of the delegation from North Carolina, but it did at least sort of kind of create coherent communities of interest. Um, and then there's a final kind of gerrymandering which is known as incumbent gerrymandering. Um, this is, you can see that crazy district there, right? So that was a district that was essentially created, that, this was created by the Democrats in, 2000, in the 2000 redistricting in order to benefit a series of Democratic incumbents who they wanted to. Then the other thing they did is they did a bunch of hijack, what, something that's known as hijacking, which is where what you do is you take a district and you draw it so that it puts two incumbents in a head-to-head -head race against each other. So they, they, did, they did hijacking and then they did a bunch of incumbent gerrymandering to protect uh, Democratic incumbents. 
Um, and again, you can sort of see that this is really sort of like a crazy um, effort to protect power rather than to represent community. Um, and so, you know, this is how you gerrymander. We're, gonna, we're going back to Goofy kicking Donald Duck, by the way. Um, and uh, you can see Goofy kipping, kicking Donald Duck over there on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, it's kind of a little bit hard to see. And then on the left-hand side, that's the, the carve-out. So you, the way you gerrymander is by doing something that's known as packing and cracking. You usually kind of do a little bit of both, right? So packing is where essentially what you do is you create a bunch of sacrifice districts. Right, so the thing about gerrymandering is that comp contrary to kind of at least a few popular misconceptions about gerrymandering, the point isn't to draw yourself a collection of overwhelmingly safe seats. Instead, it's to actually give your opponents a small number of safe seats, sacrificial seats, right, while drawing yourself a larger number of seats that are not quite as safe but that you can expect to win really comfortably. And you do that by packing and cracking. So you pack into the sacrificial districts. You can see that district there on the left-hand side, right? What they did is they essentially packed all of the Democratic voters into that district. That district right there went to Hillary Clinton in 2016 by a margin of 82%. And you can sort of see at the bottom left-hand side that, that thing that kind of that juts out right there, that super blue thing. That's a town that is heavily African American and, and working class, right? And then the other thing that they did in Pennsylvania is they cracked. And that's where what you do is you, you kind of, you, you, you toss a few Democrats in, you, you crack Democratic strongholds out across, but then you, or it could be the other way around if you're a Democratic gerrymanderer, right? And, and then, but the, you, so you kind of toss a few Democrats into it, you crack up kind of um, power centers amongst Democrats and spread them out amongst multiple different um, districts so that they can never really get together strong enough to win anything. In, in Pennsylvania, as a result of this, right, the, um, in, in election after election from 2010 on, uh, Democrats would consistently win the, um, uh, the statewide House vote by 54%, 55%, but they would only usually get five out of 18 seats. So you remember when I showed you a little bit earlier the way uh, the, the Pennsylvania 7th, Goofy Kicking Donald, had been redone as a result of a court case. In 2018, a Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on the basis of state law, redid Pennsylvania's districts because they were gerrymandered. And as a result of that, in the 2018 election, the Democrats won nine seats and the Republicans won nine seats. So you can see sort of like how redoing it, and, and that formed the backbone of the Democrats being able to take control in 2018. In fact, one Brennan Center analysis showed that in 2018, more than 70% of Democrats' gains nationwide came from districts that were drawn by independent commissions or as a result of court rulings. And only 19% came in districts drawn from Republican legislators. So that's one of the reasons why kind of breaking gerrymandering hold is really important. Um, and what you can see that happens in packed districts, right, is, again, to go back to what I said, those wasted, what's known as wasted votes, right? You literally have people who are just throwing their votes almost into the void because no matter how hard they vote, in and ha you know, like no matter how many of them vote in Pennsylvania, when it was gerrymandered, they were only ever going to get five congressional seats. That was it. Just wasn't going to happen. So those were wasted votes, and it was a, a really awful form of um, voter suppression in Pennsylvania. Um, so as you can see, the, the the point behind gerrymandering is essentially to assure control of government partisan control of government in good years and bad years. And this is an example from North Carolina, uh, which is one of the incredibly heavily, or at least was until recently, a very heavily gerrymandered state. Um, it's a state where 
it's similar to Pennsylvania, the uh, Democrats could win a majority of the votes, but never gain control of the House, the, the North Carolina House, the North Carolina Senate, or the congressional delegation, delegation from North Carolina. So why is it important now? Well, it's happening all over again. We've been living with the consequences of the 2010-2011 redistricting for the last decade, and it's about to happen again. Um, there are two reasons or two things that are of critical importance with it. The first is the 2020 census. So to kind of give a quick, you know, kind of 101 on the way uh, congressional uh, seats are allocated. Um, so as you know, there are essentially 435 uh, congressional seats in the House of Representatives. That number was established in 1911, it's not changing, okay? So the way states get seats is essentially kind of rudimentary, but basically true. You figure out what the whole population of the United States is, people, and it's really people, everything from like a one week old to you know, 110 years old, everything from a citizen to a documented, immigrant to an undocumented immigrant. People are what counts. So you take 435, you divide it into that number, and you start out, and then you figure out, well, okay, so that's about this, this time around, right? That right now we're working on about 710 to 720,000 people per congressional seat. And so then what you do is you take a look at the population of, say, California, and you say, oh, California has, I'm just gonna make this up, right? You know, California has, 7.2 million people, therefore California gets 10 congressional seats, right? So that's, that's about what's, that's what we're about to go to. We're about to go through, first of all, reapportionment, the decision on how many congressional seats each state gets. That's via the census. And that's why counting people is so important, right? Because you want to have all of the people in your state counted so that you can get as many congressional seats as you possibly can for apportionment. So I just for the record, it's, it's already kind of the thinking is already that California is probably going to lose a congressional seat. It has 52 right now. The thinking is it's probably going to drop to 51, but there's no telling, right? So, um, so then after that happens, after the seats get apportioned to California, then California decides to draw the lines. How are we going to, you know, draw those 52 little districts or something like that? And, um, and that's where gerrymandering happens. It's at that stage of the game. And there's an additional wrinkle to the way the census is being done right now, which I probably won't bore you with too much, but we can, uh, we can do questions about if you want. So when a, um, uh, a, a, a state draws those lines, right, typically they've drawn it just based on there are 700,000 people in this area, right? But there's nothing constitutionally that says they have to draw it based upon that. And there's a movement afoot in a lot of states where they would draw the 700, the, the lines based upon actually how many citizens there are within that region. And so what that does is also significantly diminish the possibility of democratic representation in states like Texas or North Carolina or Florida, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's kind of complicated to explain, but, that's uh, one of the impacts of the census that we're about to go into. So that's one of the reasons why the redistricting that we're gonna go into in, in 2020 and 2021 is so critical. The other thing that's making gerrymandering so crazy right now and so difficult to deal with is new tools, basically big data, right? So. 20 years ago, if you were trying to gerrymander, you might draw five or seven different maps, you know, different, different versions of the map, and then kind of pick the one that you thought was best for you, and then, you know, kind of, you'd, you'd have to deal with a little bit of luck, right? But now, we can see down almost to a block level what the voting patterns are. And not only can we see down to a block level what the voting patterns are, we can run thousands of simulations where we draw the line here versus we draw the line one block over versus we draw the line right up there or anything like that. And as a result, you can refine the gerrymandered map perfectly. So in 
for example, take uh, North Carolina's congressional map, which I've spoken about. This is a kind of, so they reverse engineered the way North Carolina was gerrymandered. And when they reverse engineered it, they ran 24,518 simulations. And in every simulation that they ran, more than 99% of them, so right, so let me back up. Right now, North Carolina's congressional, they've got 13 seats. They've got 10 Republican seats and three Democratic seats. And it's pretty locked in. There's no, there's no changing it. So at, when they ran those, those 24,518 simulations, this is when they reverse engineered it, more than 99% of those simulations produced at least one more Democratic map. In other words, it was only one, almost one out of 24,000 cases that produced a 10 to 3 advantage. 24,000 others produced a 9 to 4 advantage. So that's just to tell you how precise they can get in terms of running a gerrymander. Oh, well, the, the Republicans chose the one that gave them 10 to 3. They, they, chose, the, they chose the 1 in 24,000 chance, <laughs> 1 in 24,000 simulation. Um, so, it, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned in, in 2010 this was the result of a very, very sophisticated Republican effort that was undertaken. It was called Red Map, and it was um, with millions of dollars at their disposal. They had control over essentially 40% of all congressional seats to be, that were available to be gerrymandered. And, and it was done using these sort of sophisticated tools. What you, what you see up there is, again, my favorite goofy kicking Donald Duck um, down, to, down to a block level. Um, and you, you can see how carefully those lines were drawn, literally kind of looking on a block-by-block -block basis of, of voting patterns. I had, um, when I was kind of driving around, I drove the whole district line. Not the whole district line, because you saw that thing. That would have taken me three days to just try to, and with a rowboat, to actually draw parts, to, to actually go along parts of that district. But you know, you, you, would, um, you would be kind of going along, and you would just like turn right and left. And you would be like, literally, on the right-hand side, it was a Republican you know, block. On the left-hand side, it was Democrat block and they knew and just drew lines right through it, just like so every single vote. Um, so we're, we're headed now to 2020 and 2021. We've got a census that is critical, and we've got new tools that are going to make all of the difference in terms of the way gerrymandering happen, happens. But there are new solutions to gerrymandering. With all of this stuff comes new solutions. And that is really a trifecta litigation, <laughs> commissions, and winning state elections. Um, so there have been a lot of litigation successes. This is the state of current litigation on gerrymandering, although actually Pennsylvania in there is, 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 a, is finished. It's not currently under litigation. It's pretty much done. I, but, I wouldn't ex but I wouldn't be surprised if we were right back at it in 2021, actually. Um, and you know the the so there's a lot of litigation going on right now. As many of you know, there was a big Supreme Court decision that came down earlier this year, where the, the United States Supreme Court essentially said, you know, partisan gerrymandering can't do anything about it. You know, non-justiciable. The federal courts are not going to deal with it. That doesn't mean that the litigation is over. There are at least two to three different types of litigation that are going on right now. There's litigation on the on a state constitutional basis. That's what's happening in that's what happened in Pennsylvania. That's why all those districts got redrawn. And it's just what just happened in North Carolina. Um, and, and in an extraordinary decision um, where a, uh, a superior court of North Carolina basically said, nope. Now they redid, uh, the, that decision dealt with state um, electoral districts, not with the, the federal ones. But everyone is anticipating kind of an immediate turnaround and a move towards uh, dealing also with the, um, with the congressional districts. But don't forget, whatever litigation they begin in North Carolina over congressional districts is going to be over the way it was done in 2010. They're going to have to reinitiate in 2021. So it's, going to, it's just going to be really complicated to see what's, you know, how it's going to happen. But it is an, an extraordinary avenue um, that's being pursued and that might have a, a terrific amount of impact. In addition, there's another form of litigation that can happen, which is um, under the Voting Rights Act. So uh, racial gerrymanders are still 
subject to litigation. The Supreme Court didn't wash its hand of racial gerrymanders. And then you can see Michigan and Ohio, both of those had um, active cases that involved partisan gerrymandering that had reached a, a pretty heavy state of, um, of ruling, but uh, they're, they're presumed defunct right now as a result of the um, Supreme Court decision, but no one, no one knows for sure. But litigation is a, an incredibly viable tool in a lot of states. Um, it, it, but it's not like it's not a slam dunk. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't. It doesn't always win everything. You might be able, like I showed you in North Carolina, you might be able to redraw a few of those little districts, right? But it doesn't have a, a necessarily a dramatic effect, and it takes an awful long time to bring this litigation. You know, we're we're talking here in Michigan and Ohio litigation that has been going on for seven or eight years over the 2010-2011 lines. Um, the other main um, technique, um, oh, and I was, uh, the other main technique that is, um, is uh, sorry, and you know, I also should have added that Virginia was also um, subject to um, litigation, and so the Virginia districts were redrawn in 2018, uh, 26 Virginia House districts were realigned um, as a result of it, so Virginia has been um, in, in the middle of some pretty active litigation as well. Um, and then there's the commissions. Um, so a lot of states have really succeeded in um, kind of taking uh, the partisanship out of district drawing. They've created nonpartisan or quasi-partisan or you know kind of um, uh, professional redistricting commissions. You, you can see that it's complicated. Not every commission is. You know, not all commissions are created equal, right? Um, but a lot of them have done an extraordinary job of it. And in, um, for example, uh, you know, in, in California has got an, a, a very effective commission. In Michigan, in 2018, in Michigan and Colorado got commissions through referenda. The people voted for a referenda. One of the things about gerrymandering is it can't win statewide. Gerrymandering only works when you're kind of dividing up people, but when everyone in the state votes on something, like you can't gerrymander a governor's election, right? You can't, you can't gerrymander a referendum either. Everyone in the state gets to vote for it. So when there's a, re a statewide referendum, you can overcome gerrymandering and force the state to use a commission. So in 2018, Colorado and Michigan created redistricting commissions. By the way, the Michigan Republicans are voting to, um, to hold their commission, or not voting, they're suing to have the Michigan commission declared unconstitutional. Um, don't, don't laugh, it could, they, they, might, they might have a point. Uh, it, could, it could, you know, there's no telling what the outcome is going to be and if the Michigan case, you know, depending on how far it makes it, um, it, depending on how far it makes it, it's gonna impact California's commission because the Michigan and California commissions are not that different. So the litigation that's going, that's initiating in Michigan right now is gonna have an impact on California possibly, depending on, on how it goes. Um, you know, there were other things that happened, you know, for example, in Ohio, uh, the voters passed a requirement that any redistricting has to be done with a super majority. So um, in order for redistricting in that state to pass, it has to have uh, more than 60% of the votes in the House legislature, and then it has to be sent to a backup commission for certification. So, you know, there's this great movement going on right now with commissions um, that really have very effectively kind of taken the partisan poison out of the, out of the redistricting process and have really kind of made redistricting about democracy and about community and about representation, not about partisan power or racial power or incumbent power. Um, and then the final thing is state elections. Um, you know, uh, for example, um, in 2018, Democrats gained control of six state governments. Um, for a total of about 14 versus 22 for Republicans. Unfortunately, the Democrats who gain control of the six uh, state governments for a total of 14 right now, yeah, got it in state, mostly in states that already have commissions and where there wasn't a lot of a lot of gerrymandering in in general. Um, but 
you know, Virginia in 2019 is about to have its, um, its state election. And in Virginia, they've had regular and systematic gerrymandering, racial gerrymandering. And so depending on what happens with the, um, with the state election in Virginia, that could have a real huge impact in 2021, in 2020, and 2021 when they, um, when they do their redistricting. Um, and it, some of the Virginia Democrats have, there's a, there's a kind of a movement in the Virginia Democratic House to create commissions or to take a little bit of the partisan ire out of the redistricting. But there's also a, a similar number of Democrats in Virginia who want to just gerrymander themselves, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of one of those things that happens, you know, just the blood gets boiling, right? And, and having kind of suffered under 10 years of gerrymandering, everyone's like, we're not letting that happen to us again. But I think Virginia is going to ultimately, you know, kind of cool down and, and, and do a, a decent redistrict as long as there's a kind of a, a decent kind of uh, outcome in the 2019 election. So those are the three big things that are happening with redistricting right now. And the last slide I've got for you is just basically I wanted to provide everyone information about how California does it so that you can see an example of the, uh, the kind of the incredibly complicated steps that you can go through in terms of redistricting. But, but you know, I think as many of you may have read, California is in the midst of um, constituting its redistricting commission. And I read just recently that more than 7,000 people applied for it. So, you know, I used to think this was the wonkiest topic in the world. I was like, who in the world is going to apply to be a member of a commission, you know, to rob? But 7,000 people applied. So this is not the most, it turns out this is not the most boring, wonky thing in the world. This is something that's really important. Um, so I, I hope I have not exceeded my time, and we're going to have a chance to have um, questions and after Mary speaks. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. Sorry. I did. Uh, there, there was one other thing I wanted to say, which is that um, the, the Brennan Center does a lot of work on gerrymandering. I am not the gerrymandering expert at, at the Brennan Center. I, I, uh, I, I absorb this by osmosis and by working with some extraordinary people. And if any of you are on Twitter, um, I would uh, say that uh, Michael Lee and, and Tom Wolf from the Brennan Center are well worth a follow. Um, if you're interested in gerrymandering, they're always on top of it, and you can always see what's going on by following them. Thanks. So the first, first thing is, there are some more seats up here. So if you are sitting on the aisles, and you see that there are seats in your row, Please move toward the wall. So there are a lot of folks standing in the back. So there, there are seats up here. Folks can come up here. I think there's at least one seat up here next to Herb. There are seats there. Okay, there's another empty seat here. And there, there's another empty seat. Somebody can tuck themselves right in here if we need. And three here. So there's seats there. Okay, so what I heard was Democrats can come out and vote and actually win statewide but they don't get the seats either in the state legislature or in the congressional delegation. I, quite frankly, find that to be appalling and frightening. So are you alarmed about our democracy? You should be. We have been asleep at the wheel. The voices and votes of citizens all over the country have been diluted, suppressed, and stolen. And we have to do something about it now. Merely electing a new president will not solve this problem. It didn't start with Trump, and it's not going to end when we get rid of Trump. Gerrymandering has created fissures in our democracy that need more treatment than just change at the top. And we all need to do something. 
We can't just be angry. We can't just be depressed. We can't just hope that all this goes away with the 2020 elections. Last week, right here in West Marin, Dolores Huerta reminded us of Helen Keller's dire warning. Science may have found a cure for most evils, but it has found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. We can't be apathetic. And not being apathetic, there are things we can do. So once again, why should we care? We're in California. We're safe. We're not gerrymandered. That's all those folks over there. Well, the basic fact is that the votes of some people in many states simply don't count as much as the votes of other people. For example, when the majority of Democrats in a state are packed into one bizarrely drawn district so that they win one district but have no chance of winning other districts, that's voter suppression. Even when Democrats win by a big majority in a packed district, it eventually le leads people, even Democrats, not to vote because their votes are wasted. Doesn't matter how many people vote or how few people vote. The way it's set up, the Democrat is going to win that one safe district. This may not be a poll manager standing at the door demanding a voter ID, but it's voter suppression nonetheless. In those districts where most Democrats are intentionally excluded to ensure the incumbent Republicans are elected over and over again, fewer and fewer Democratic candidates will challenge the incumbent, and fewer and fewer Democrat voters will vote. That's voter suppression. Finally, in those states where Republicans have drawn maps to ensure their own reelection. They have used their legislative power to enact even more overt voter suppression laws, such as preventing ex-felons from voting or reducing the number of polling places. Elected representatives who are supposed to be accountable to their constituents can ignore the will of the people because their re-election is virtually guaranteed. That's what we have to do something about. So all of this tear is tearing at the fabric of our democracy. We, here in California, West Marin, we have the luxury and indeed I would say the responsibility of being able to assist others in their efforts to achieve fair electoral maps. And by the way, it's not just doing something for those folks over there. Because you know what? If democracy can be eroded over there, it will eventually be eroded right here. The state legislative and gubernatorial races of 2019 and 2020 will dictate the outcome of elections for the next decade, just like the Republican red map strategy did for the past decade. But we can influence legislative elections in other states by working for Democratic candidates who pledge to support the drawing of fair maps. We can make phone calls and write postcards, especially to people of color who have been purged from the voter rolls and need to re-register in order to vote. We can make phone calls and write postcards to voters in support of specific candidates and to get out the vote. So there's a small leaflet in your chair. This is what I told you to hold on to. Pull it out, take a look at it. Make sure you put it in your pocket and take it home. This is, has the 2019 elections that are coming up that are really important. The first one coming up is in Virginia, as Victoria mentioned. And it's a, the Virginia State Legislative Election. It's on November 5. That's only two months away. The GOP controls each chamber of the legislature by only two votes. Two votes, folks. We only have to flip four seats. 
The Democrats are in an excellent position to capture control of the legislature, which will then redraw the electoral district maps in 2021. In addition, there's an important Virginia state constitution pending, as Victoria mentioned, in the legislature that would establish an independent commission to redraw maps in the future. And by the way, I want to note, we're supporting candidates who support the drawing of fair maps. We do not support candidates who just want to turn around and gerrymander just like the Republicans. Two other Two other statewide elections will take place on November 5, Mississippi and Kentucky. In Mississippi, both the legislature and the governor will be up for election. Now you may think, as I did, that the Mississippi state elections are a lost cause. But please don't forget that the Democrat Mike Espy almost won the U.S. Senate race in 2018, coming closer to winning such a seat than any Mississippi Democrat has in the past 36 years. Things are changing and it's in part due because people outside of Mississippi care what happens and realize that it affects us just as much as it does them. Our efforts are really worthwhile there. In Kentucky, there's a really important gubernatorial race, if nothing else, because it's symbolic. The Republican legislature will redraw the electoral district maps in 2021, but the newly elected governor will have the power to veto them. Everything we can do to help elect a Democratic governor will be critical. And by the way, if you think Mitch McConnell is vulnerable now, just think what it would mean to energize that state electorate if we elected a Democratic governor right before his reelection. Yeah. And finally, on November 16, the Democratic governor of Louisiana will be up for re-election. His re-election is essential because although there is a Republican-controlled legislature and it will redraw the maps, the governor will have the power to veto unfair maps. Now, on the other side of your flyer, where it says Indivisible West Moran, that tells you what you can do. It tells you where and how you can join together with like-minded people to have a good time and to do good things. We gather three times a week now, twice on Tuesday, once on Thursday, to postcard and phone bank for democracy. I know that there is at least one time slot that will fit into your schedule and if you can't do it then on the group schedule, we can train you and you can do it at home. An hour or two of your time once a week will make a huge difference. There are other organizations in East Marin and indeed San Francisco and all over the Bay Area who are doing the same things. If you need help in finding them, please sign the sign up list that's going around um, as soon as we start questions and answers, please indicate that you're looking for something to do in a particular area. We will get back to you and we will connect you with that organization. Does it make a difference what we do? You bet it does. It was help from people in California, postcarding, phone banking, canvassing in other states that helped flipped the House of Representatives in 2018, because we helped the others, that created that tsunami that Victoria referred to. We can help do the same thing in these important 2019 state races, and there are plenty more state races to come in 2020. And just in case you have forgotten, because we've said so many things, the reason these races are important is that despite the fact 
of commissions and other reforms. There are still 37 states in this country who allow the state legislature to draw these electoral maps, and therefore they are free to gerrymander and tear apart our democracy. The Republican strategy 10 years ago was to vote, limit access to voting to ensure their side won. Our strategy is to open up access to as many people as possible to ensure that one person truly has one vote and every vote counts. So now I want to open it up for questions for Victoria. So, because there are so many of us here, um, we don't have a mic that's being passed around. Um, so please speak loudly. Victoria is going to do her best to repeat the question. And don't forget, it's all being recorded for everybody else to listen to at some other time. So please, Molly. One organization is leading the litigation effort against gerrymandering. Is that uh, so the question is, uh, what organization is leading the litigation effort against gerrymandering? Uh, it's, a, it's a coalition of, of groups, um, so everything from the NAACP, ACLU, uh, Brennan Center, Common Cause, uh, League of Women Voters, uh, those have been the, the kind of the main groups who have been doing a lot of work. Um, I would say, in general, and and they uh, the, the the these groups uh, meet regularly and and sort of you know figure out strategy and what's going on. So the question is about why state districts are different than federal districts. And um, the, the, the short version is, is, is essentially, uh, the, is as, as I indicated to you, the, in, the fed, at the, in the federal system, the number of House seats are, are, are limited at 435, right? So when a uh, California, for example, has, as I mentioned, 52 federal representatives, but your California House of Representatives is much bigger than 52, right? You, you want your House representatives in California to represent a smaller number of people than kind of 720,000 people per, per California representative. So, it, you know, it's just basically different numbers. Uh, you've, got, you've got to draw 52 boundary lines for the federal districts, but then you've got to draw, and I don't remember off the top of my head how many members of the House there are in California, but let's just say 180. So, so you've got to draw a different 180, and then you've got a Senate, um, and that's going to be, um, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a kind of a different number. So it's, it's, it's essentially as simple as just numbers into, you know, it's just the, the numerator and the denominator. The denominator is always the same, the population of California, but it's the numerator that's different for each of the bodies. So they're drawing different lines um, as a result of that. And the state legislature draws the lines for all three. So the state legislature draws the lines for the federal districts, the state house districts, and the state senate districts. Yeah. Yeah. Is it only through a referendum? What are the ways that states can be moving in that direction? So, so the question is, what are the ways that the states can be moving in the direction of a, of a commission? Is that... Well, so, so first of all, not all the commissions have been done through referendum. Many have been done by the, the, the state house and state senate, the state legislature itself voting to do it. So it's not uncommon for for it to be done that way. And so, you know, there can be, you know, m movements within the state to push their legislators to do it. And if they're responsive, they will, and they have. 
Then the other main mechanism, obviously, for doing it is, is via a referendum. That's what happened in, um, uh, uh, Ohio, in Ohio. It wasn't, a, rev it wasn't a, a commission, but it was the supermajority requirement. In Michigan, it was done through a referendum. In Colorado, it was done through a referendum. So those are the kind of the two main mechanisms uh, where it can, how, how it can be accomplished. Yeah. Changing our population and, and undocumented, uh, undocumented. Yeah, it, it's going to be a, probably a triple whammy, right? So other states are going to have gained, are going to have grown population faster than California, right? So there's going to have been a huge, you know, kind of influx, or, or there's been a, you know, in a, in other states, um, as as people have been moving, like Nevada is, is a, a, you know, a state where that that always happens. Um, then uh, the other thing is, is that there might have been a, a kind of a drop in population in California, um, which I, I don't know off the top of my head. And then the third thing is, is, is an undercount is a huge issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> desperately trying to understand. <laughs> it's so not intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Victoria, you said earlier that the mapping mm -hmm. is being based on voting patterns. But not everybody votes, and not everybody in the census who hopefully will be counted is able to vote. I don't understand the connection between the, the voting patterns and the population. I thought they were measuring the population. Oh, so, so the question is about uh, explaining the difference between um, voting patterns and, and population. Um, and and that's a, that is actually a, a very good and subtle question. Um, and uh, because you're right, the district lines have to be drawn to encompass 710,000 people, not have 710,000 voters, right? So, but fortunately, there's big math and big computers that essentially allow you to run multiple simulations on drawing these lines that include 710,000 people, but maybe only 200,000 voters, and you know exactly how those 200,000 voters vote. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm not the person who's programming those, those creating those programs, but I know that they, that they are doing exactly that, and that's how they're, they're able to do it, yeah. Could I just add one, yeah. one little thing to that? Um, I, that's a really good question. And one of the organizations that we work with is the Center for Common Ground, and they have an initiative, a campaign, called Reclaim Our Vote. And one of their complaints is that um, political consultants, and unfortunately that includes <coughs> excuse me, the Democratic Party writ large, focuses on voting patterns of people most likely to vote. That writes off many, many, many people of color. And so a lot of times these gerrymandered districts don't take into consideration people who just don't vote or don't vote regularly or think that voting is something not within their realm, and that's usually and often people of color, so that when you mobilize people of color to vote and other folks who don't normally vote, we have a much better chance of winning. So voting patterns do matter, whether it's a pattern of voting or not voting. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna just uh, to, to follow up on that, you know, uh, gerrymandering really does rely upon kind of a certain passive voters, no change in voter behavior. And if you, can, if you can alter that equation within a gerrymandered district, you can, you can overcome the gerrymander. Yeah. Yes, Herb. I, I heard in your biography that you spent a lot of time working for a senator from Illinois. In Illinois, there was just something more old-fashioned graph. To what extent does graph, money graph play a role in uh, so the question is, to what extent does money graft 
pay, play a role in all of this? I, I'm, I'm actually going to say not that much. I'm going to say that power is like vastly more important in this than money. Um, power is, is, I mean, sure, part of the reason people want power, you know, political power is as an opportunity for graft, but um, it's, you know, I, I, I think it's really just about power, you know, political power. Sure. So the the question is, uh, there's a court case going on in Michigan challenging their newly um, uh, created uh, commission and how it could impact um, California's. Um, so now I'm, I'm 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 I want to encourage everyone to read more about this, right? So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get this right. Um, Michigan has a nonpartisan commission in much the same way that California does. And it has a requirement that certain people can't be on the commission. So um, uh, it bars a certain class of political people from being on the commission. And there's an argument that that violates First Amendment rights. And it's not without some merit. I'm not sure ultimately what's going to happen to it, but it, it is, a, and it's it's a very nascent case. It's really just been filed within the last, I want to say, six months, um, because the the commission was really only voted in, in in 2018. So it's a it's a little baby case right now, but it's worth it's worth paying attention to. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not dissimilar, and so that's why if, if, if the Michigan case succeeds, it might create a, a, an opportunity to challenge the California one. Yeah. Yes, Carolyn. Um, well, what are the classes that are excluded from the commission? Oh, people, people who are registered, uh, certain people, not all of them, but registered Republicans or Democrats. Mars has 20 of each, so. No. Why don't, you, why don't we put it back up if a we can? Of oh, a certain kind of number of certain number of Democrats, certain number of Republicans, certain number of nonpartisans. Yeah. And the nonpartisan is can't be a registered Republican or Democrat. Okay, but as long as there are some, anyway, it doesn't sound like. I, I think also yeah. some of the people who are excluded are people who are elected officials. Or, or who are somehow politicians in some fashion. So the effort is really just to make this a citizens commission, yeah. not just a repeat of politicians. Yeah. Yeah. Rob. So from the uh, from the the list, though, I, I also wonder how does race play into the commission, and how does the commission uh, stop racial gerrymandering or racial segregation in that way? Uh, I see it's, it's uh, nonpartisan, but it's, it's yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a that's an interesting question. I think that um, I'm sorry. The the question was is that since the, the how does race play into the nonpartisan commissions since the issue is partisanship rather than than race? Um, uh, the 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 short answer is that the commissions, in addition to their composition, are also given a really strict series of guidelines for the basis upon which they can draw the lines. So it's not just that we're going to pick you know, 20 people who have this kind of partisan versus nonpartisan balance, but it's also that the lines that they draw have to be on the basis of a certain number of rules. And those rules explicitly, obviously, bar the consideration of race in drawing the rules. And I don't honestly know off the top of my head how California is is operated, but um, there's a substantial chance that they're not even able to look at racial composition of districts when and as they're drawing their lines. Now, the trick to that is that, um, not in the case of California, but in some states, um, the Voting Rights Act actually um, encourages the creation of 
uh, majority minority districts, and so the use of kind of racial data is important in drawing the lines. Um, but um, but that but usually the way a commission deals with it is strict rules and controls of data that's even available. The other thing that this commission tries to do um, is to, which is something that all of us do in all kinds of organizations, is the hope that a diverse group of people will be on the commission and therefore will be looking out for those kinds of issues. And in fact, even though there was a huge thousands of applicants, the, um, I think it's the state auditor who's running this process, actually extended the application time for applications because not enough people of color, women, older people, disabled people had applied and so they wanted to have more diversity. So that's just one effort. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a, I'm sorry, the question is what does nonpartisan mean? It's a, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to answer because everyone is, is in some ways or another aware of the, the love, you know, Democrat, Republican, but uh, it, it, it means, first of all, a balance of the parties, um, so uh, equal numbers of Republicans or Democrats, and then it includes, as I indicated, this effort to um, include nonpartisan, i.e. non-registered, people, non-registered Democrats or non-registered uh, Democrats or Republicans onto the commission. Yes, that, that also that. Indepe independents are considered non-Democrats or non-Republicans, non right? Not every state has that That's correct, and so I can't answer to you how every state might construct a non-partisan commission based on the way that they've got their particular state you know, kind of, uh, there are some states that have no, uh, no party identification required. So I don't, I don't know how they would manage to create a nonpartisan commission when you don't actually have a public record of what your party is. But you know what I mean. It's every state is going to have to draw a commission or create it a little differently. So, so the trick to a nonpartisan commission is not only its composition but also its rules, that for how the lines are drawn, and those rules dictate. Uh, in many cases, for example, racial neutrality, or they also dictate that you can't use partisan information in drawing or registration information in drawing district lines, or that you can only use it in certain circumstances. That's kind of what happens in Arizona. Arizona is really complicated when certain bits of data can be drawn in by the commission to use it. And, and then the other thing that happens with nonpartisan commissions that you know make them kind of like or that helps reinforce the nonpartisanship is that the process is incredibly transparent. Um, it's not like you know kind of you know five you know the state you know the Senate majority leader you know the House majority leader and the governor getting in a room and drawing some lines that no one ever looks at. It's incredibly transparent. Everyone has the opportunity to look and dig into what's going on. And so as a result of that kind of blend of activity, you get nonpartisan. You know, no, but nothing's ever perfectly nonpartisan, right? But you're, you're, you're headed in that direction through all of these different moving parts. Uh, don't a third of the states not allow initiatives? So the question is, don't a third of the states not allow initiatives? I don't know the number off the top of my head, but that sounds about right. Yeah, there are a bunch of states that don't. For example, uh, North Carolina doesn't have an initiative system. So North Carolina is a real, real problem. So we just have to do it through the legislature. That's the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Louise. Can you tell us what the status is of the census, the 2020 census regarding the citizenship? So the question is, uh, the question is, can I uh, say what the status is about the 2020 census regarding citizenship? So uh, it's the question will not be included in the 2020 census. Yeah. But, but, but two. I was going to say, but two things. Uh, first, there's already an effort to get it into the 2030 census. Uh, and and second of all, uh, I think as you probably know there's an executive order to ask the Census Bureau to call, not through, you know, the, the, the census that you, we all think of, the decennial census, right, is, is the big thing that the Census Department conducts. But the Census uh, Bureau also uh, runs a bunch of additional um, 
you know, surveys, the, 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 American, the, the American Community Survey, they run that uh, on, the, on the regular, right, and gather a lot of other supplemental information. So the Census Bureau is allowed to collect a lot of information besides the kind of the decennial census. And um, right now there's an initiative going on to essentially create a citizenship database that could be used um, in, in drawing district lines. And, and we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is that Laura back there? Or? Um, okay. Yes. Uh, I understand that there are still a number of states where there's uh, DREs, are, yeah. yeah. are proprietary, and I understand there are a number of states where there is no paper ballot. And so I think this is the first cousin to gerrymandering in our concern about elections being valid. Sure. So, so the question is about the, the use of machines at, at different voting machines, and in particular um, uh, DREs, which are direct recording equipment. Um, you know, the what, what would you, you know, kind of the touch screen voting, right? Um, and uh, that they're they're proprietary, that no one knows, and that they that they vote flip. Uh, and, and they actually do. I mean, there's been, for the longest time, it's been this sort of sense that, um, you know, you're just imagining it. But in Texas last year, the Texas Secretary of State actually acknowledged that it was indeed flipping votes. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was just a processing thing. It wasn't like someone, you know, kind of went in there and kind of reprogrammed it to, to fake it. But what was happening is you had to dial this wheel right, in order to kind of vote the straight party line. And what was happening is, is that some people were dialing the wheel and pressing buttons too quickly. And so the, the machine was kind of going like, Argh. and I, I don't know enough about that. I'm not enough of a machine person. My father probably knows what this all means, but I don't. Um, and so, the, the, so the, the votes were rendering improperly and they were flipping. They really were flipping. Um, and so the, the point is, is that there are a large number of machines uh, that are used in, in a lot of districts that don't have a paper trail, right? So, uh, so they, they flip or, you know, a machine goes down and you can't, there's, there's no audit. You can't ever double check or anything like that. So um, I would say that those, that those machines are still holding on, but they're really moving out. Um, that um, in uh, that last year, I think it was last year, or it may have been 2017, I can't remember exactly when, but at the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018, Congress actually put $328 million in the kitty to get rid of those machines and require them to adopt paper trails. Um, so it's slowly but surely, probably not fast enough for our you know, comfort, but the, the, these machines, these DRE machines with no paper trail are being phased out and paper trails are absolutely being implemented. It's imperfect, even those, but it is indisputably the consensus nowadays that you've got to have paper trails and that anything less than that is really um, a, um, a mismanagement and, and malfeasance in terms of the way our machines work. But I think, as you all know, there's like a big hoo-ha in Georgia about this right now. Um, there's definitely issues in Texas, so it's you can't you can't be confident about this. But but it's it is absolutely a consensus that these machines have to go. Um, so. November 2012, yeah. Yes. I yeah. recommend everybody read 
Yeah. Okay, we, we probably have uh, time for maybe two more questions. Uh, sure. yeah. yeah, you mentioned the Red Line initiative, and it sounds like they went sort of state by state with the strategy. And an earlier question sort of alluded to this. I was wondering, sort of, how did they organize that? Who funded it? And do the Democrats have a similar centralized strategy? Um, so, oh, sorry, the question was the Red Map Initiative in 2010 and 2011, how is it funded, how is it organized, and do the Democrats have a, have a comparable one? Um, it was incredibly well funded, uh, many millions of dollars, and the donors, some of them, or some of the people who funded it are hidden in the mists of time, and others are, are, are pretty well known. I think you can probably guess who some of them were. Um, and uh, uh, it was it was 100 percent organized uh, centrally um, by the uh, the Republican National Committee, which um, and by um, I think by Crossroads, um, by Carl Rove's group, um, and um, and so and it was uh, and they 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 funded and paid for a bunch of consultants who were you know very sophisticated data analysts who were able to to draw the maps. Do the Democrats have a comparable one? Yes, um, yes, uh, th there's a, you know, the, the Obama um, holder organization, it's not um, red map-ish in as much as it's not kind of dedicated to, you know, kind of this, you know, aggressive gerrymandering, but it is dedicated towards fair redistricting. And, um, and so there is, there is definitely a, a comparable effort. And there's also a comparable, you know, kind of data-driven um, understanding of the issue on the Democratic side, as we you know nowadays. So one more question. Ah, uh, Kim. Yeah. So I came in late. I apologize if you come this, but when they're gerrymandering a district, they're looking at addresses, they're looking at streets. How do they know what vote that house, that household has made? They're looking at my address. How do they know how I vote? Um, they don't. Well, uh, the, the question is: they're, they're looking at it when they're drawing the lines. They're looking at the at the at the vote. Uh, they're looking at their um, they're looking at addresses. They 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 know if you voted. They know how you're registered. They know your socioeconomic status. Now you may be a registered X, but actually have voted Y. That's true. Um, but they can determine based on your socioeconomic status, your registration, your actual registration, and your previous voting patterns. They can to uh, and your precinct pattern. Sorry, how, how they they know if you are a regular voter. Um, they know if you voted in the Democratic primaries. They know that you, or the Republican primaries. They they know that you didn't vote, you know, in that election or this election, or whatever. So they they know how often you vote, and then they do know your, as indicated, your precinct results. So even if they don't necessarily know it down to you, they certainly know it down to the block pretty closely. Well, so how are they going to mix up precincts? They know what precinct results. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, so the question is how are you going to, sorry, I, I'm not sure I'm going to say your, the question right, but how do you, um, how, do you it, how do you redraw a, a pre, if, how, how do you break gerrymandering? Well, you're saying they're assuming people vote a certain way because right. of how their precinct vote. Right, because of how their precinct how, how, So precincts are artificial lines to begin with, so you can always redraw a precinct line. No, they right. assign the vote to the address. The voting is so let, let's hold yeah, on. Let's, let's, let's hold on for yeah. one second. So it's not I so Ken. Ken, no, okay. no one All knows right. how you voted, but they can tell how you likely voted from everything that Victoria just said. They also, by commercial data, the big data, they know the kinds of things that you buy on the internet, the kinds of organizations that you click on to, those kinds of things. So it's about likely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying they're looking at you, like, watching you as you go into the poll or anything like One that. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Um, oh, so so the question is, can I uh, talk about proportional representation? So proport as an as an alternative. As an alternative. Yeah. Um, so to quickly describe proportional representation, and we have a little we have a little game in our office for who can describe proportional representation uh, clearly and quickly. Um, so proportional representation is usually kind of multi-member districts. So um, rather than having, you know, kind of, so in Marin, you know, it's this, you're in the second congressional district and one person represents you. So the idea would be actually that what you, what you have is uh, a bigger district, but three people represent it. And then you divide those three people up based proportionately on how the vote happened. So if, you know, 66% of the people in the district voted Democrat, then two of the three would be Democrats, and then the remainder would be a re Republican, right? And so that's, that did I, I okay, as long as I just, you know, so, so that is, it. so, um, so you're, you're right, that's absolutely a, um, a, a solution, but it's a solution that would only be implemented by a vote of the legislators who want to maintain partisan power to begin with. So it's a very rare thing to see multi-member districts or proportional representation implemented by a, by a legislature. It, they're as likely to stop gerrymandering as they are exactly. to implement proportional representation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I, and lit litigation, yeah. you know, uh, commissions yeah. and wi winning elections. Because at the end of the day, you know, a a a, a, a big wave can can knock down gerrymandered walls. That's yeah. what we want to do. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you all so, so much for coming. Please make sure that you signed up to get further information or to ask questions or to make sure you're connected with an organization that is doing something. And please don't be apathetic. Please do something. Thanks so much for coming, folks.